Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good. Uh, yeah. Welcome. Welcome to another session of the Nollywood Studies, Studies Center Filmmakers Forum. We have with us, we have with us today a very good, very good friend of ours who has uh, given, who is willing always to give us so much of his time. And this afternoon, or rather this morning, he's going to be sharing with us his thoughts on various things. Femi, you're welcome. Femi Udupemi, like I said, is a long standing friend of the center. But I would also say he's a long standing friend of the Nigerian film industry. He has been in this industry from really, I would say, virtually the beginning of this industry. And he has, as it were, done a lot in terms of contributing to the development of the industry. Femi is a producer, he's a director, he's a scriptwriter, he's a maker of documentaries. And then curiously, I think something that many people do not know or do not pay much attention to, Femi is also So he is someone who is truly you could say, gifted in terms of contributing to the industry. Don't mind me if I blow the feminist trumpet quite a bit. He doesn't do it enough himself. And then being uh, his friend, I think I am in a good position to, to do some of that blowing for him. So, Fabi, you are welcome. Thank you very much for agreeing to be with us today. Thank you. Now, if you permit me to just give people... Great. Just give people a bit of an idea of your background. That Femi was born in, in Lagos. He's an eco man, as we would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> born, bred, and buttered. <laughs> and he obtained a film and television production degree in Montana State University in the United States. And he has worked, he spent a bit of time after that with the Nigerian Television Authority, a very brief period. But he has also he has also worked in advertising, okay, because he's worked as a film and radio producer at Linters Advertising and McCann Erickson. He has also written, directed, and produced various documentaries, short films, and drama. Among them, we have documentaries such as Ibadan, Cradle of Liberati, Oriki, and The Chain Was Not, Rolling Dollar, A Legend Untold. Dio Fagunwa, Language, Literature, and Literalism, and of course, the well-known Barika Boris. These are some of the documentaries that Femi has produced. But then Femi is also noted for his soap operas. Femi has been involved in some very successful soap operas. Well, the very first one amongst them is Tinsel. Tinsel, I think, has a record so far in this country for longest running soap opera. So far, it has 3,031 episodes. And it has been referred to as the most successful television drama of Nigeria television in recent times. Another one, which is also being similarly successful, is Battleground. And then we have one that started with recently, The Brethren. And of course, Femi has also been into feature films. We have films such as Mamakut, Marocco, Giddy Blues, The Eve, Missing Pages, The Fourth Estate, Cold Willow. These are just some, I'm not saying they are all but just some of the things that Femi has been involved in. But then if we turn to a different area, Femi has also been very much involved, like I said, in documentary production, but he is also trying to working at strengthening that sector because he has uh, co-founded the I Represent International Documentary Film Festival Makers, which is now in its 11th year. And I must congratulate him for that. It's not easy at all to keep a festival going and going for that long. And since 2018, Femi has been the Academy Director of West Africa for Multi-Choice Talent Factories. He has been president of the Independent Television Producers Association of Nigeria, and he has also, or he is also, a voting member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in the United States. Femi has received various awards for his many contributions to the industry. And well, I wouldn't go through all of them, but amongst them you have that of Best Director for Babbage Blues, Best Film, his uh, Mamakut won the Best Film of the Abuja International Film Festival in 2009. 
He is also he has also received a Film Excellence Award from the Society of the Performing Arts of Nigeria, and a similar award, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Nigerian Film Corporation, and also the Excellence Award in Film by the Society of Performing Arts of Nigeria. Like I said, I have not said everything, and Femi will pardon me that I don't read everything, otherwise we'd be here. <laughs> Femi's list of achievement. This is just really to situate us, so we know who it is we are having this conversation with. We hope it's going to be a fruitful one. Now, please send in your questions. I will ask my questions first to get the privilege, but I'm the one hosting this. <laughs> and then we'll take other questions as we go along. So please type in your questions in the chat box as we go along. And then when, uh, at some point, we'll, we'll turn to those questions. So Femi, once again, you are very welcome. And thank you ever so much for giving us this time on uh, Saturday, which is a busy time for me to But let me get the ball rolling. Now, you are quoted as having said that my philosophy, I'm quoting you now, is that I am not just a filmmaker. I am an African filmmaker. That is an identity that I take seriously. And it is an identity that inspires my content. I believe that my art and my identity are interconnected and must feed each other. The idea and the context and culture of the artist shape his work. Filmmaking, as all artistic undertakings, is a cultural practice, and every form of its interpretation enriches and projects the experiences of a culture as captured from the artist's perspective. That's a pretty long quotation, but I think that it sums up very much all that you have been doing, all that you've been trying to do, and I think it expresses something that drives you. Can you talk us a little bit about that. What is your concept, your philosophy, as it were, for the work that you do as a filmmaker? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bea, for the invitation. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to have this conversation uh, with the larger industry. Uh, I'm very proud always of the work that uh, you have done and the Nollywood Center has done in, in um, seeking to archive uh, this movement, this, this expression called Nollywood, and to actually uh, put some academic rigor uh, to not just, um, you know, uh, uh, documenting its existence, but to giving it the existence meaning uh, going forward, and to help those who are coming behind to, to find their way um, through the path of those who have gone before. So the Nollywood Center is an incredibly important institution uh, and I, I, I will always support uh, the work that you're doing there. I also want to say I've been um, part of the PAU family for a long time now and, and I am even more proud um, of the work that's being done with the master's program in film because one of the things I have often spoken about is the lack of a, a solid curriculum for those who wish to study film, not just to make film, but to actually um, bring some intellectualism and some rigor, some, um, you know, uh, research into the, into the craft uh, of filmmaking in Nigeria. Having said that, I believe every filmmaker, every artist, uh, everyone that creates needs first and foremost to have an understanding of self. Um, by, by that I mean we create out of a worldview. Um, and the worldview of any human being is um, guarded on all sides uh, by, very four, by four very important things. Uh, one, of course, is origin. Another is, is meaning. Another is morality and another is destiny. Um, until you have resolved those questions within yourself, uh, who am I? Where do I come from? Uh, why, why am I and, you know, from Yoruba land or from Igbo land? Or what is it that is in that space that is a part of me? Um, what is the meaning 
of, of you know, the totality of, of my understanding of my origins. And that's when you begin to also confront the questions of ethics, morality, good and bad. What's good, what's, you know, what kind of, of things do I believe in? And of course, destiny being um, what I consider my purpose. How do I wield this power of creativity? Um, using an understanding of my own origins, my background, um, understanding my space in terms of, of the meaning of you know, my life, uh, finding my place in terms of the, the moral compass with which I create, and then you know, applying it to a purpose. Unless you've resolved those as an artist, you cannot begin to actually create any work that has impact. And there is nothing worse than to put the power of the arts, uh, the attention of an audience um, in the hand of, of someone who is emotionally literate, who is intellectually bereft, who is educationally um, unprepared. And for me, that is why I have said uh, a lot of the things that I have said. I consider the artist, the public intellectual in, 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 in this century, simply because a lot of what we do in the exchange of information actually is done via filmmaking. Uh, you can't really be a great doctor unless you can show me an MRI that, you know, kind of tells me what you're going to do. That is infused into every profession, storytelling. But storytelling is merely a tool. A storyteller is really the key. And until the storyteller is empowered, educated, um, conscious, and embracing the power of his storytelling, um, it will be very, very difficult for him to do anything consequential. Uh, and that's dangerous in an environment of development like Africa has, like Nigeria has. I think it is incongruous for us to have the sort of country that we have with so many challenges that we have. Uh, we have development challenges, political challenges, we have all kinds of challenges. Uh, we, we, we have issues in, in the social sphere um, that are not going away. And we need our, our artistic um, um, community uh, to use their work to foster change, to use their work to speak to what's going on, uh, to use their work to foreshadow a future that's better than our past and our, and our you know, contemporary history, uh, we need our artists to be consequential. And the first thing they have to embrace is the idea that they're not just filmmakers, they're actually African filmmakers, which means that their, their origin um, needs them to speak to their environment. And their art is the power with which they can do that. So that is my philosophy. And in that philosophy, storytelling is really my focus. Um, I studied film, I studied cinematography. I, I find um, all of that as simply tools handed to me to be a more impactful storyteller. And I tell the students of the, of the Multi-Choice Talent Factory that tools are important. Education and knowledge is key. But application, in the end, is, is what matters. And for me, um, the, the place of application is in not just you know, your story, but what kind of story, what kind of themes, what kind of impact um, do you aim for? In, 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 a, in sort of like long form is a basis of my philosophy, my creative philosophy, and it is really how I interact. Um, within the industry uh, as well. Um, and I have to say this, that also presupposes that the things that I consume to enrich me so that I have some kind of uh, foundation for, for the things that I do, um, span the whole of the arts. Um, writing, you know, books, art, um, sculpture, uh, the whole forms for me uh, becomes the education that I need to uh, be able to solidify the philosophy that I've espoused. Thank you very much, Femi. Now, what you have just said brings to the fore 
a question which has, you could say, dark the African cinema. Mm. The at the beginning with the whole uh, with the whole the initial movements, people thought that the position for many for many persons was that film, the cinema in Africa should be used as a means of teaching. Should be used really is more in the sense of forming people. This was a push at the beginnings of African cinema. But then this has led from many sources to the great criticism of Nollywood, that Nollywood is focused too much on the financials, focused too much on the sense of making money. So this is too commercial, really. And the, the question that then arises is, are really, are the two really um, contraposed, so to speak? Is it not possible to make educative, entertaining films, telling good stories, or do we necessarily have to have that break between a film that is uh, entertaining but empty and one which is stilted but educated? Now, how do you see this? This seems to be a part of the challenge now because many of the films we could say really are not aimed at forming in the way that you have put it but there's more concern about feeding some emotional state of perhaps the audience or whatever. What is your view on this? Well, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not unaware that we come from a, a historical place where our film industry um, became, you know, uh, was given its, um, its, uh, economic foundations from a place where the focus was about making money. And I don't think it's incongruous for an industry to, um, to have you know, that sort of focus. It's very important because it, it speaks to trying to aggregate an audience. And I do think that we have to accept that uh, that sort of uh, focus has expanded the audience um, for the last 25, 30 years and Hollywood has been. But I do think there is space for many kinds of filmmakers. I think that one of the mistakes we make is to define success in cinema only by how much money the film has made. Um, and the problem with that is that it feeds into incoming um, younger filmmakers were trying to make a way, it feeds into them the erroneous notion that if they can just figure out a way to throw, you know, 30,000 stars into the film, if they can just find a way to uh, make every line in the film a funny line, if they can just go to the most outlandish spaces and just couple together scenes that are interesting or funny, um, then they would have a successful film. So the, the, the focus shifts from the storytelling itself um, to how do we make money? Uh, I don't think it's, it's a way forward, in my opinion. I don't think um, we do damage to the future of the industry itself when we think that someone who makes a an empty, totally empty, ridiculous piece of business, and but manages to constantly shout about the movie making hundreds of millions, which is possibly true or not. Um, to make those the heroes of a film industry ensures that we will never expand our audience. We will never, our films will never travel. We will never get the sort of critical acclaim that we need to get into the festivals that will take us to um, spaces like the Oscars. Uh, and why is this important? It's important because film is a cultural practice. Film is actually cultural diplomacy. Our stories have been told by others for years and years, simply because we did not have the skills, we did not have the budgets, we did not know enough about cinema to tell our own story. And now that we are, I think it's a sober 
um, thing to do to understand that we have a duty beyond the personal, beyond the, you know, the, the mercantile to actually also uh, tell the stories of our times, find those, and it, I don't think it's one is exclusive of the other. If a story is well told, um, it makes money. There's a lot of very, 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 very um, um, successful films that are very good stories as well. And for me, I think the difference has been that we have neglected education for so long. We've assumed that anyone that wanted to, all you needed to do was express an interest and you could become a filmmaker in Nigeria. Um, and so I've always said that the, the absence of our, of our focus on education for film for a long time has also become part of the problem. So now we're making a shift uh, places like, you know, School of Media and Communication now offer uh, training, you know, um, uh, multi-choice talent factories offering training. There's a lot of training institutions that are springing up. I think this is a very important um, um, shift because what it will do is that it would offer to those who want to make money a path that also allows them to make meaning. And, and, and to think that, you know, you have to be incredibly intellectual uh, on one side and make no money and, and be totally illiterate and just laugh a minute to make money is a distinction that's false. Uh, I don't think I've ever been, uh, been, been poor uh, seeking to make the kind of films that I make. I don't. I've never made a film that made a billion naira, but I've never needed to because the films I make will, film is a lifetime property. Um, so to think of film as something that I've got to make uh, a thousand percent of profit today, right after I make it, is, is a fallacy. It shows that you really don't understand the responsibility of filmmaking itself. So I do feel like, you know, it's it's a false, false distinction to think that, you know, it's one or the other. It has to be both. We have to have films that are also artistic, uh, may not be commercially viable, but artistic, not even political, not even development, artistic in its essence, because we also need to, you know, consume those as well. I think it's all about better empowering the storytellers so that the stories uh, begin to have a bit more meat, a bit more focus, a bit more purpose. And then our filmmakers can begin to develop their own creative identities, signatures, uh, that will allow us to be able to then, you know, push into different genres. Um, that's really what makes for a robust film industry. Um, documentary is also part of that, the capacity to use film to engender debate, to, to have conversations and discussions of issues, to push for change in certain areas, uh, also comes when the filmmaker is well aware of his power. And I think that's really what the, the, the difference is, to understand that, for the filmmaker to understand that this is not just a trade, this is actually um, a calling, it's a, it's a profession, it's something that empowers you beyond making money and it gives you a voice. Um, to be able to influence people. Thank you, Femi. Now, on the back of that, you have spoken about the need for educating the filmmaker, that it's necessary that people become better aware of the trade and of the tools available and the purpose. But do you also think that there's a need to educate the audience? Because many times, uh, not many times, really, all the time. It is the audience that determines. And I think that, to a large extent, we have tended to take that audience for granted. For instance, the common thing that is said is that for the Nigerian audience, once you have a comedy, it sells. Now, that is something that is an assumption which has not been, you could say, studied. Nobody has carried out deep research to actually established that that is the case. But that is on the one hand. But I think that if we as if we say, for instance, that the audience determines whether a film sells or not, and if filmmakers become more aware of that fact and get to know their audience better, would it not also help in this regard? Because many times 
you find out that some people are scornful of the products of the industry and there's nothing being done to win those guys over no no okay no they're despised the these guys don't need them we have these other guys who do understand but out of the so many million in this country you can see that from the income that's coming in we're really not tapping into all of that what role really does the formation of the audience in terms of film appreciation play here well, I, I, I think we underestimate how much the audience is educated, quite frankly. Um, and I say that because when we say that, we, we speak as though this audience is in a bubble. This audience is not in a bubble. This audience has is, is got Netflix. This audience has got Amazon. This audience has got access to international films. This audience... Um, go and watch drama from America. Why are our distribution film companies still bringing in any other kind of genre apart from comedy? If they're so convinced that our audience only like comedies, why, why don't they just put a blockade on every kind of other films? No action, no horror, no drama. We just want comedies. Just keep bringing us, you know, um, you know, coming to America two, three, four. That's all we want. Is that possible? If, if, if they put promotional money behind dramatic pieces, if they're willing to um, look at the, the, the nominated films for the Oscars and bring them to Nigeria and market them, and I bet you not a single one of those is a comedy. It, it's It's superiorly rare for a comedy to actually be nominated for best picture. Why? Simply because at that level of filmmaking, we're looking at themes. It doesn't mean that the film cannot have a fu funny moments, but moments are not themes. <laughs> themes and gender reflections. Themes indicate a filmmaker who has processed a, 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 a subject matter and has diffused it into characters in such a way that when we go in, we're not just laughing, we, we feel things. Cinema is about feeling things. It's not about ha 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 and then we forget it immediately after. Yeah, there is space for comedy. I love comedies. I love to laugh. Um, but I think when people spread that, um, they underestimate the audience itself. They insinuate an illiterate audience. Uh, they insinuate an audience that is monolithic, only want one thing. <laughs> um, but I think why that sustains is very simple. We are running a, a multi-billion Naira industry without verifiable figures without any data. <laughs> I, I find that to be perhaps the most ironic thing we are doing, that we, we government has tried to invest in our industry several times, but somehow they miss investing in some kind of accountability structure. So that when I tell you my film made 5 million, I can actually give you the lowdown of the seats and how it happened. And there can be an independent body that actually verifies that. It's not the filmmaker that should be telling me that they made um, 500 million. It should be an independent body. That's what happens elsewhere. <laughs> because unless we have that data, we're not able to really know what slice of the audience likes what. How many times did they watch it? Is it that they have assumed that you our industry cannot make anything else. I think those are, or, or they think that the stars that we have only know how to be funny. I think it's a big indictment to say that not only on the audience, but on the filmmakers and on the performers. I, I imagine that a lot of our performers, a lot of our actors have become incredibly good over the 25 years of Nollywood. You have to, Accept that, in, in all honesty, um, 
anything that you practice, you get better at. Some of these actors, um, I saw them in, in the early days in Surulere, and we used to have a big laugh about the fact that some of them actually considered themselves um, to be acting. But now I see them, I see them, and I'm awed by how, how really good they've become. So the real problem is the scripts that we are giving them insult them, <laughs> insult their own progress, insult how far they have come. We, we, we actually need to concentrate not on taking moments and making it the whole film, <laughs> taking incongruous scenes, packing them together for 90 minutes and calling it a feature. Those are the things we're still doing because our focus is commercial. Once we actually get our focus out of the commercial, and, and this is really where the problem is, a lot of those films, a lot of the humor that we have in our films are not humor that other people get. <laughs> it's, it's very strange because a lot of, I've shared some of our films with friends internationally and even the ones that I find to be incredibly funny, the guys stare at them with, with like a really blank, you know, stare. Cause they asking me, okay, what makes that funny? So comedy is the hardest thing to do for a global audience, because there are many people that don't get British humor. It's very dry. There are some humor from America I find incredibly offensive. <laughs> and, but I, I, I like our humor, but we cannot, we cannot decide, um, how do I say this? Filmmaking is, 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 is an art that's over hundred years old. We cannot reinvent the wheel for ourselves. All the things that we like to do that are part of our origin, that are parts of, of our industry that are doing it with intelligence and grace. Look at what Steve Gukas did with living in, uh, uh, Steve Gukas and, 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 and um, uh, what's my friend's name, the director. See what they did with living in bondage too. It's still Ramza. about, uh, uh, yeah, Ramsey. Oh, beautiful work that Ramsey did. Ramsey is an incredible director. And, and, and between him and Steve, they showed us the power of collaboration. They showed us the power of taking what is African, i.e. the fact that we, we operate in many realms, both the, the, the normal and the paranormal. And they took it and still, you know, brought sensibility and filmmaking news into it. That's why we, we are not saying abandon comedy. We're not saying don't make us laugh. We're not saying don't do um, juju. We're saying bring artistry to it. Don't cover it like it's a TV news material. It is, what is missing is artistry. And artistry only comes through education. And so the way to fix it is the more educated our filmmakers are, the better our films will become. The more our filmmakers will understand where their specialties lie and they'll do them. You cannot aim as an artist to capture all of the audience. It makes no sense. I don't want everybody. I want those who get what I do. <laughs> and that slice in a 200 million population country is huge. So for me, um, it's a false argument. It's a false thing to tell young people. And then some friends of ours did that with some of these young people, told them to take their loan from the Bank of Industry, go and make a comedy, and then they all go and make all these things where it's almost slapstick, big, you know, B-roll films um, of, of old. And it all just, it, it just looks, you know, cooked up and totally without a recipe. And that, that to me is what I hope our focus on education will fix. Okay, thank you very much, Femi. Now, quoting you once again, you said somewhere that stories sustain cultures and inspire change. It echoes some of what you've already said. Stories impact governance, development, business, commerce, education, technology, and innovation. I want to link this to a question which has come in. This is from Ronke, who asks, 
how does a filmmaker stay true to his or her craft and message in an environment that may be hostile to speaking truth to power or exploring unpopular opinions that contradict the conventional status quo? It may even be politically dangerous in certain contexts. Now, this is linked to what you said, stories in black government, because this many times leads to a certain self-censorship on the part of our filmmakers, because we know the exaggerated way that sometimes, well, <laughs> those in certain positions come down on filmmakers, and it stops people from doing what uh, Jonathan Haynes, he refers to what is typical of the industry as a social commentary, because really, the earlier films had more of that. Now, how do, does a filmmaker, as Ronke asks, deal with this? Well, first of all, I, I think that it takes a lot of courage already to be a filmmaker. Um, if it's something that you had to choose, uh, if you really don't have the passion for it, um, it's just too much trouble, to be honest with you. Uh, from the writing, the idea, to the making, to the post-production, to the, and you finish all of this sometimes with you know very little money, uh, a lot of distress. Uh, so. I already think for you to be a filmmaker, you, you already have the basic ingredient of courage and focus. Um, I think it is part of the craft to simply decide your truth, take your story, um, make your truth and put it out there. I always say to young filmmakers, who always want people to say how great thou art, you're not likely to last. You'll either kill yourself or somebody will kill you and take you out of your misery. The truth of the matter is we live in an environment where there are people who are constantly speaking truth to power and they're not even filmmakers. They don't have a lot of audience. We have we have guys in the media who are speaking truth to power. We have people in the in the uh, you know in the good in the civil society who are speaking truth to power. Uh, we have artists who are designing and doing cartoons that are speaking truth to power. How we speak truth to power is not about our tools. It's about us. It's about the courage we need to understand that. Okay, I'm a filmmaker, but I'm an African filmmaker. There's no way my films can ignore what surrounds me. That is specifically different from propagating lies. I am not in favor of unresearched opinion stuff that I just put out there. I'm not a big fan of social media, um, you know, battle rangers, those who are always calling for war when in fact all they have is data. I don't, I'm not in, in, in favor of undistilled thought that is just from pop, popular opinion. But if there is research, if there is clarity, there are ways in which you can do fictional looking films based on reality and in such a way that, what am I talking about? Shawaroi Day is my greatest Nigerian film of all time. It had courage, it had power, it had creativity. Shawaroi Day was released at the height of General Apache's fearsome power. And everybody that watched that film knew what Tundekelani was talking about. That to me is what it takes. There is no one that could have arrested Tundekelani and say, oh, but you're talking about, but they know. They just simply realized that somehow he had made something that paralleled our current situation, situated in a village, the same titula kind of, you know, uh, 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 despot, he put it there. It was just perfect. It's one of the reasons why, you know, our greats like TK are, are respected. Um, there is laughter in their films as well, but there is, there is insight, there is clear commentary, there is distillation. Um, and I'm not sure that everybody has always loved this film, but he has, he has lived a very robust life nonetheless. So I do, I, I say all of that to say, 
Um, and by the way, you know, full disclosure, uh, Ronke is, is my friend and one of one of the <laughs> filmmakers that I really like. So <laughs> in case you all, you know, people that know might say she set me up for the question. I haven't spoken to her in a while. Uh, I'm just looking forward to, looking <laughs> to, to, to seeing her, a new film, uh, uh, Coming Home, the, the film about Badagri, um, The Return. I'm looking forward to watching it at the IREP Festival next week. But it already takes enough courage just being a filmmaker. So just speak your truth. Just, just make that film, but make it with all the diligence that makes it impossible for you to be dismissed as a, as a charlatan. The film is only the platform. The content is the key. The storytelling at the end of the day um, is, is, is the power. How, how well thought out is it? How... And, and, you know, Nigerians are very reflective people. Um, even the most uneducated amongst them, you know, are very, very reflective. They, they can connect dots, <laughs> trust me. So th there is no level of, um, of imagination we wish to go that will not resonate with the majority of, of Nigerians. So the courage really is us to move. <laughs> It's, it's, um, there's always risk in making film. Even when you make comedies, there, there is the risk that people will not laugh. So that's my response to it. But we are in a business of courage. And um, I know that she's just asking that as a, she's a. <laughs> it's a useful question really, because there is that challenge we all face. We know the experience people have had, they make a film and when it's been reviewed, then they are asked to cut out certain segments of it. So, well, we should talk out. about that actually, because one of the greatest uh, problems we have is the idea that we have a, a film and video census board. We ought to have a film and video promotional promotions board. Censoring stuff, sitting down and saying, and, and responding by saying in, you know, in the 40 second minute and three second, the actor said, um, no, you can't do, you can't legislate creativity and art. You can give it a, um, a rating. You can say, no, no, sorry. Children under the age of 13 cannot see this. You can decide, yeah, we, we agree that that mission to protect, you know, the, the ethical framework of, 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 of our society is very important. Um, but I, I find that we do it from a civil service perspective where we're not appreciating the artistry and the storytelling. We're looking for the fault in the film. And obviously we will find one. <laughs> it's not that complicated. So for me, um, that's one of the things in the industry structurally that we need to change. And I, I hope we have that conversation one day because I think we talk about the things that are not there. We, we need to talk about the things we need to do to actually make an industry work. It's not things we do um, for persons or for small groups of people. It's things that we do institutionally, infrastructurally that allows everybody, regardless of who you are and who you know, to be able to access things that that create um, what you will call um, common standards, global best practices. Those to me are what I think has been missing from our institutional regulators like you know, um, Census Board and the NFC. That's a long answer to a question you did not ask. <laughs> <laughs> Useful, useful, nevertheless. <laughs> okay, let me take you off on a different tangent now. You mentioned a moment ago, IREP. Yes. And in 2010, you, along with others, you started the I Represent International Documentary Film Festival with the theme, Africa in Self-Conversation. The goal was to promote films and stories from Africa about Africa and by Africans. Uh, and a moment ago, you also stated that documentaries were one of the ways of 
really putting out of mm. I'm losing you. Okay. Now, do you think mm. No, it's breaking. It's breaking. I'm having trouble. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better now. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh oh, now you are frozen though. Okay. 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 Sorry. Okay. Oh, can you hear okay. me? I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Last year, I rep marked its 10th anniversary. Yes. And as much as one would have liked. But what is your assessment in terms of the achievement of these goals? You wanted to promote documentaries. You wanted to promote this conversation of, well, that Africa should tell their own stories and so on and so forth. And I think also part of the goal was to put forward the documentary as really an authentic way also of telling stories because there tends to be this view of documentaries as a poor second cousin to the feature film. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. But documentaries can truly be exciting. So in these 10 years of the IREP, what has been the achievement? Do you really think you have achieved much of what you set out to do? Well, I, I, I thank you for that question because I think one of the greatest uh, things I, I, I believe we, the industry has achieved is to actually embrace um, the IREP idea. Uh, and, and this is very important to say. IREP is about um, bringing documentary into an industry that needed it 10 years ago, much more than it knew. There is no industry in the world, no film culture in the world, where a beginning filmmaker goes from nothing to feature film. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really the fastest way to kill a talent because a feature film has at the end of it, because of its complexity, because of its commercial ecosystem, it has at the end of it, a very harsh judgment by audience, by critics, by all kinds of people, such that when a new filmmaker makes a, a, a feature film as a first film, you can kill their spirit, you can, dent their creative impulses. Uh, and so most film industries begin their, their young ones from short films, which show at, at festivals and from documentaries, which help them to imbibe the, the, the habit of research, of process, um, of accountability, because you can be accountable in documentary without the harshness of the commercial um, um, feature film. So we, we thought that that was important first and foremost for the large number of young people coming into the industry to have what you will call, um, you know, a more deliberate entry into, into the craft of filmmaking. But most importantly, we thought it was very important for us to understand that documentary was a very important storytelling um, genre for a blooming industry like ours. It, it was very important because there are stories that you want to tell that do not lend themselves um, to fiction. They, they, they need to be told from a position of reality, i.e. they might have been in the news already and all of that. But the biggest thing was about the global information order about Africa, but particularly about Nigeria. Um, the truth is, uh, uh, Jima, uh, Jimamanda talks about the, the, the danger or the tragedy of the single story. And if there is anything Africa has suffered, Nigeria especially, is the idea that we have been labeled with a single narrative. And Chimamanda said that the 
the biggest problem of a single narrative is not that it is it is one sided it is that it is incomplete and but you see you cannot put a complete narrative out there expecting others to do it for you there has to be a way of understanding that the economy of nations the politics of nations their place in the dis- diplomatic um, um, uh, you know community uh, how they are regarded in the world and what opportunities are open to their citizens come from the stories that they tell of themselves. And for us, uh, the fastest way to do that is through documentaries. But beyond that, how do we process the things that are happening to us? How do we foster change? How do we bring our governments to accountability? We're running a democracy where all we have, uh, you know, social media keyboard champions, um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing in that realm are unnoticed by those in the places of power and authority. So documentary is also meant to become a personal tool for us to respond to the things that surround us and the issues that make up our environment. So for us, has it been successful? I would say so. When we began 10 years ago, we were basically ignored. There was less than, I think there was less than 20 entries 10 years ago. Our big support at the time came from, you know, Bolanle at Terra Culture, who, who gave us the haul. And everything we had were just my documentary films, some cultural films, and one or two from, you know, other places. Um, last year, before we canceled the festival, um, we, we had over 200 entries. Two years ago, we finally had, we opened with, you know, um, Skin, a film made by a young, vibrant Nigerian actress, Beverly Naya, who actually collaborated with, um, and, uh, with, with uh, a, a colleague of hers, I made a, a, a documentary film that has gone on to be on Netflix. I do honestly believe that we now have a generation of young people who feel empowered uh, by the ge- documentary uh, genre. We now have people speaking to different aspects of you know, culture and economy and, and, and politics. I, I feel that if there is anything that IREP has achieved, it has proved that documentary can be um, very interesting, very empowering, very dramatic. Um, documentaries come in thriller, they come in, in, in you know, suspenseful, you know, documentaries are in, in, in horror forms, they come funny. They, the styles of documentaries have evolved from the days when documentary was just propaganda by government. And if there is anything that I hope we have achieved is that we, we began by saying our vision was to take documentary out of the hand of institutions like NTA, like, um, you know, uh, uh, government houses and, and, and take documentary into the hands of individuals where we can actually um, bring governments and institutions to account. Uh, and I think technology has aided that. When we started 10 years ago, you needed a lot of money to get a camera. Today, I mean, anybody can buy a, you know, a DSLR and anybody can tell their story. Uh, we feel very, very happy that the, the, the perception of documentary, um, the use of it, uh, that our filmmakers have embraced it. And it's very important to know that young filmmakers can simply take their camera and their laptop and, and they're making a film. Uh, unlike before where they wait, you know, until they find somebody who wants to give them 50 million uh, to make a feature film. Now they can actually uh, start their career and build a filmography, um, you know, making documentaries. But the most important thing is documentary um, encourages all of us to own our voice, to quote unquote, sorrows, okay, to, to actually you know, put it out there. You'll be shocked the numbers of footage, the amount of images and stuff that documented the NSARS 
um, 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 uh, the NSAS protests. Those documentaries are going to become uh, a powerful record 50 years from now, 100 years from now. They stand as witness to the times that we have lived and, oh, and the way that we lived it. And the idea that in the, in the face of tyranny, in the face of, of, of you know, um, developmental challenges, we were not silent. That is why we focus uh, IREP on young people. Um, myself and Jaman and Makin Shohinka and Theo Lawson have worked to create IREP and build it with our personal money, not because there is nothing, it's, it has always been free. Not because um, uh, we have that much money, as you know, I don't, um, but because we truly believe that if there is anything we do to empower and release the, the, true, um, the true power of, of, of the people in a democracy, is to hand them a tool that allows them to make leadership accountable. And that's really what documentary does. It, will, it is documentary that preserves democracy. It is documentations that preserves history. It is how we show that, you know, we were here, we didn't only vote, we spoke up. Great. Thanks a lot, Femi. Now, I have tons of questions coming in, and I think that people are going to kill me if I don't begin to ask their questions. Now, there's a question here from Paul, because what you just said about young people starting with documentary, building their photography, photography, but all of that still requires funding. And Paul asks, how do you see the role of financial institutions in the development of the film industry in the short to medium term? I will, add, I will add to Paul's question by asking if you can also give us some insight as to how you have dealt with this challenge of both funding and distribution, because these are two key problems of the industry. Well, I think from a funding perspective, there is something that I think we, we need to make clear. Um, there has to be um, a way in which we put a structure in place that allows us to have a pool of money that revolves, that is available to emergent filmmakers. Um, this is not a brilliant, fresh idea. This is how it is everywhere in the world. Every country that has built a sustainable industry puts a little markup on the cost of tickets that you go to the cinema, uh, the government already charges the, the cinemas a tax, an entertainment tax. But right now, the government chops most of it. Well, I use the word chop because this is us. Uh, I don't mean that they steal it. I mean that they collect it and put it with other things that they are doing. There has to be a part of that money that is put in a fund that is meant for young emerging um storytellers and filmmakers. And there is, has to be a process in which those filmmakers can pitch projects, knowing that that money is a grant, not a loan. It has to be a grant. And the, the heart of why that works is not just that they are giving this grant, they're also guaranteed distribution so it is very important to know that the way you get a young filmmaker going is you put accountability to the script and story. So there is a process for selection of the type of story. And then you give a grant to that film, but you make sure that there are experienced filmmakers who help them through the process of producing it. And then you put a distribution infrastructure together to ensure that that filmmaker experiences the entire chain gets back the, 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 the money from you know, the cinemas and that money becomes his own, how shall I say, startup fund for making another film. But it all starts from a grant supporting that filmmaker and that grant comes from a, 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 a part of the taxes of, of the entertainment tax 
of us going to the cinemas. So the industry itself kind of revolves an economy that ensures that young and, and new comers are bedded in, in a way that doesn't put them in debt. That is what we missed with what we, 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 we tried to do something with Bank of Industry. And I, I really want to say it was, it was, it was a massive, um, 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 uh, 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 it was a massive thing the amount of money the Bank of Industry has pumped into our industry. Um, but I think the big problem was that we, we also uh, needed to have understood that, you know, a young filmmaker, a new filmmaker, a beginning filmmaker, you should be able to tap into a source um, that, 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 that comes, you know, from the ecosystem itself. Um, that to me is one. Building... A, 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 a financial structure. A lot of the banks uh, did not understand exactly how the film industry worked. They, they, they tried to give loans, and I'm not talking of Bank of Industry, I'm talking of all the other commercial banks who developed what was called the film desk. Uh, they, they, they gave all these loan packages names and beautiful designs, uh, but the understanding behind them was still wrong. They're expecting a filmmaker to bring um, collateral. They're expecting a filmmaker um, to tell them exactly how he's going to pay back in exact terms. Uh, those are conversations you, you should be having with someone who is a spare part dealer. We are in a creative industry, which means that a filmmaker can make a film that makes 100 million naira today and makes one that makes nothing Tomorrow, it is it is a, a business that actually um, it's in the law of averages, really, that a filmmaker sustains a career. But that is why a film is a lifetime property. It's not something that you trade in and get back your money right away. So there has to be a way in which we bring that understanding to how we provide funding support. But I also think you know institutions like Nigerian Film Corporation, um, institutions, there's a lot of NGOs outside the country who support filmmakers. But the Nigerian Film Corporation ought to be the middleman connecting us filmmakers to these funding opportunities. One of the things I keep saying is we ought to be able to open the, 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 the website of the Nigerian Film Corporation and find a new opportunity every week. That really ought to be their business. Their business is not organizing anything. Their business is actually providing opportunity. So when, when, when I, 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 I like the fact that, and, and you got to give them credit, they, they already have um, institutions they put together for training. That's one part of their business, the NFI. And it's a very important place. And, and I congratulate them for sustaining that. And that place is incredibly equipped and good. The second part of their remit is creating opportunities. Opportunities are not only about giving money. Opportunities are sometimes just about information, about how we are to go, how to qualify, what the deadlines look like. That's how active and dynamic I expect their website to be in support of the industry. I don't expect the Nigerian Film Corporation to be in Abuja or to you know, sit far away in jobs. I expect them to be in Lagos so that they can actually moderate the opportunities that are happening. Part of it is resolving the issues of distribution because distribution now is not just about cinemas, it's about platforms. And now you find that people like Netflix have aggregators. Those aggregators have friends. And so you have a, a, quite a chunk of folks um, who still can't get their films out there simply because there are gatekeepers <laughs> who have interests. And for me, whether it's Amazon, Netflix, Showmax, whatever, those are the opportunity gates that I think a neutral organization or a neutral facilitator like the Nigerian Film Corporation ought to be engaging 
so that all the films that represent Nigeria on those platforms are not just Lagos films. There are filmmakers in Jos. There are filmmakers in Kano. There are amazing filmmakers in Abuja. There are very good films. I met a filmmaker in Ondo for crying out loud. I was impressed with how much, because you look at the, the quantum of challenge he must face. He certainly cannot rely on just the cinemas in his environment. There has to be a way in which distribution is not totally fanned out to private sector. Because now it's not just about cinemas. It's about building those platforms. I am incredibly proud of some of our um, industry personalities who are building platforms. Um, and Vivo is something that I'm looking forward to seeing how it evolves. Um, uh, Moabudu is creating amazing, amazing platforms that are going to empower people. So I do feel that distribution will be, there will be an abundance in a matter of, 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 of a few more years. But there has to be a way in which there is an umpire who is actually ensuring that these opportunities, both the financial and the distribution, have what you would call um, um, a balance and equity. I'm not talking about just equality. I'm talking about equity. <laughs> um, it's, it's sad for me that a lot of the money of the Bank of Industry were taken by, um, by matured, experienced, stable filmmakers who didn't need that money. And when they took that money, they denied those who are younger <laughs> from access to them. I know a lot of young people got money, but imagine how many more could have <laughs> if some of us, you know, simply allowed those, those, those fundings to be available to those kids. Um, we're going to have a lot of educated filmmakers in another five years. What we are doing now in education, not just the, the, the multi-choice talent factory is, in my opinion, doing amazing work. Um, the School of Media and Communication are doing amazing work. Uh, there are quite a few others that are emerging that I expect will also do amazing work. So maybe going forward, we all need to figure out what is the curriculum for teaching film in Nigeria and can we standardize that? And part of that standardization will be also, how do we also focus on research we can't all be filmmakers. Can we get some researchers? Can we get data? Because those are the things that if I turned into the NFC website, I should see. I should see data. I should, because that's what sells us abroad. Um, there's a lot that we, are, we have left undone, but I feel we are a work in progress. So I keep, I keep looking down the line and saying, what are the things we need to do today that will make a difference in five years, in 10 years? Uh, not just to my career. I mean, I'm, 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 uh, I, what I have to spend now is less than how long I've come. But for the future, for the for the for the incoming, for those whose passion are driving, and that's all they have, uh, we do owe responsibility to build a future that is that has opportunity, and then that has prosperity um, in this industry. Thank you very much, Fabi. Now, there are quite a few questions that have come uh, with reference to some of the things you've just been saying, and there are two sets. So I will just ask you these first set, still back on education, if you can respond very quickly to them before I ask you another set which have to do with distribution. Now, Tony says, you have emphasized education a lot in this interview. Most times when people hear film education, the mind quickly grasps camera work editing, sound recording, the crafts or tools. Kindly elaborate on film education for us, and especially what space would you give to film reviews, film criticism, and film history in film education? Now that's one. This is, I think, is linked to Adibin Pei's question as well, when she asks, are there any sessions that can be organized to teach us pitching our film projects across genres and ways of getting funded and support? But she goes on to add that the access to learning filmmaking academically is still limited, expensive, and out of the reach of several people. It isn't particularly cheap, 
she says, to attend PAU and MTF led by Fabio Dugrami and, and the MTF, I'm sorry, led by Fabio Dugrami in West Africa, picks only a handful. So how do people really learn? Any scholarships? It also seems there are age restrictions. Well, I, let me take um, Tony's uh, question first, and I hope I don't forget being paid on by the time I'm done. Um, I, I can repeat it for you if you want. <laughs> I'll show you. Where you want. Um, <laughs> I, I think that it's, it's, it's elementary to think that um, film education is about camera ed editing, and uh, that is part of it, but that's the tool part of it. Any form of education actually enriches your thought process empowers you up here. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of folks who have, who have equipment and, and they tell awful stories. They just, where to point the camera is not, <laughs> is not something they have processed. So I do feel that there's a lot to be learned apart from the, the tools of filmmaking. There is a, a thought process. There is storytelling to be learned. There is, um, how to lead in that process of filmmaking to be learned. There is some appreciation, which I believe to be the greatest way you learn cinema. Uh, you don't learn cinema really by simply grabbing a camera and doing it. You learn cinema by watching cinema. The truth of it is, this is a craft that's gone for hundred years plus. There's been a lot of approaches, a lot of styles, a lot of genres, but there's been a lot of artists who have expressed themselves in many different ways. The biggest education is actually imbibing those, those films, watching them, analyzing them, figuring out why, what, and how. Film education is imbibing the film language itself. It has a language. There is a visual language. There is meaning to the shots. We just don't, I mean, you look at some of our films and, and people go from a close up to a wide shot. People would suddenly um, take a camera. They have two people talking. They'll suddenly just put the camera on top and you're asking yourself whose point of view is this? There is a way in which we need to understand the intimacy of spaces in the film language. And unfortunately, those are things that you have to formally learn. You can't figure them out by yourself. And why is film language important? Audiences across the world have, have connected this as algorithms of how they decipher the emotional relationships in a story. And we can't reinvent the wheel. The visual language is the visual language. It will continue to be. But beyond that, it is because the visual language we haven't really had literacy about it. Uh, it it's, it's the reason why those who have become film critics have emerged from the same mindset that those who have become filmmakers have emerged. A lot of our film critics, and I have to, I, I say this uh, with great respect, a lot of our film critics are ignorant fools. They, they, they go out there, they watch a film, and they go on social media, and they give away the entire plot of the film. They tell the story, the entire story of the film, basically cutting off the knee of the filmmaker. They say stupid things like, oh, if I were the filmmaker, I would do this. Well, you're not. <laughs> but do you understand what the filmmaker is trying to do? Film criticism is serious business. You yourself have to be incredibly educated in form, in lines. You have to be educated in, in the structure of emotional spaces, blocking. You yourself almost have to be a director of film for you to understand how lighting works, what that lighting is saying, how you know sound works. Um, there are so many things in layers in cinema that a film critic needs to know that the clap in the cinema is not the sign that it's a good film. But these are the critics we have. And the difference is again, that they are uneducated. The fact that you can write an essay does not mean you can critique a film. 
It is actually a specialized business. And I think our media should stop putting, you know, people that they don't know what to do with, they throw them into the film area and the person just watches all kinds of stuff and writes all kinds of things. And I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong to drive certain narratives about, about our film industry that has become popular. Saying nonsense stuff like, you know, uh, uh, the actor, I like how they are a good role interpreter. What the hell is that? There is nothing like a role interpreter. There is a director. <laughs> there is a director. And in the midst of all of this, we've diminished the role of the director, disempowered the director. So you now find on our sets that is the actor telling the director what they are going to do or not do. And if we continue in that uneducated line, we will throw everything on its head and we will never get to the place that I believe our industry can get to. So we do need everyone. We do need, we need the film critics. We need the, 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 you know, the curators. We need the commissioning editors. We need the filmmakers. We need the performers. We need the writers. We need everybody in that ecosystem to prioritize education. At the end of the day, that's the only way in which our films will make any meaning out there. Nobody internationally is going to judge our film on the basis of its own rules and regulation. They're not going to judge our film on the basis of the fact that we like it. They're going to judge our film on the basis of does it speak to them? The universal language of the human condition it's global, it's not, uh, whatever language you use, um, the film language itself, the visual language itself is the key. And everybody have to, and we have to understand that our critic, our, our film critics, other people read them and, and they really put forth, you know, just anyway, let me leave that. Going to the late, uh, to, to uh, Maya Burrow's question, Yes, film, 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 film schools are expensive. Film education needs to be valued. It needs, it needs to be appreciated. It's specialized. It's, it's something that can make you a multi-billionaire sometime in your future. So it costs money. It's not just in Nigeria, it costs money everywhere. <laughs> there is no country that can educate millions of people in film. It's not a mass product. So we have to embrace that. Um, you said the MTF only um, 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 admits 20 people. Yes, that's because of the intensity of the curriculum and the fact that we want them to really understand all these things I'm talking about. It's harder with a larger class. With a smaller class, we can actually give um, close marking. We can give opportunity. We can give equipment to everybody. We can put everybody inside um, ongoing productions. Uh, but those 20 people are also carefully selected because we selected 20 people out of 3,000 applications. You have to understand that we're also looking for something. We're looking for people of the highest intelligence who embrace what we're trying to teach. The first thing we do is to, is to do something we call the unlearning and relearning mojo. And we've done this with the School of Media and Communication as technical partners. That was deliberate. We're, we're aiming for, the, for intelligence, not just creativity. Because creativity that is absent of a vibrant, vibrant intelligence creates really poor quality outputs. So we have to respect the fact that um, we, we, that knowledge is, is valued. Um, there are going to be more places where people can apply. There's a lot of filmmakers who go to um, pencils. Pencils has trained quite a few, quite a lot of people in many different spheres. Um, the Itpan Training School used to train people. Training is not something fresh. The Nigerian Film Institute has been training for years. And, and Dr. Kwasi, uh, Professor Kwasi created that many, many donkey years ago. A lot of those who are very active went to NFI. So I do think those who um, understand the value of education um, will also find a way to, to, to get in one of these things. Uh, truth be told, people are finding a way to find money to make film. 
the gospel that I am on about is for them to prioritize education before they make film because it makes the film that they make more valuable and longer lasting. Okay, thank you very much, Femi. I will just respond very quickly to a question from Olayinka who is asking, now you can add to this later if you want, Femi. But Olayinka is asking, do you consider script written by a non, by a script writer with a non film uh, background? So somebody who doesn't have a film background, would you consider a script for him? And I dare say that it will depend on the quality of the script. And of course, with much of what Femi has said, well, whoever is writing a script needs to understand certain technicalities. Otherwise, well, it wouldn't work. Okay? So, well, Femi, you can add to that later. If Nothing more to add. Yeah. The truth is the script. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, I said I had another set of questions linked to what you said earlier on distribution. And it's a very interesting one that uh, Annually asks. And she says, what do you think the increase in interest of Netflix means for the film industry in the long term? Most of the local audience appears to be somewhat excluded from the Netflix boom. Now, this is also linked to a question once again from uh, they being there, who is asking, where do we get to see African and Nigerian documentaries? Okay, so how do we get documentaries to be accepted in the mainstream channels? Then there is a third question still linked to distribution. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to locate that. Okay, then. Why can't we have our own SVOD distribution channels? Getting on Netflix seems like war. You seem to have some connections and have your films distributed by their main aggregators in Nigeria, which is Film One Distribution. This in itself also seems to be some monopoly. And then a fourth person wants to know, where do we see your films? What platform do we find them? Well, at least for the TV series. Yeah, they are, they are going to choice. Okay, I'm, well, going to well, you, <laughs> I'm just going to cherry pick, actually. <laughs> I'm going okay. to cherry pick. Okay. The, the one that is most interesting of the questions to me is how do we get um, documentaries and, and alternative films onto platforms and international um, um, spaces? Um, that's, that's, that's my new mission. For me, I think um, our first mission is to ensure that people understand how documentary can be powerful, how it can become a storytelling form that, and how, and hopefully they embrace it and they start making film. They are beginning to do that and we're very happy. Um, so the next level is that we've got to figure out a way to create or, or, or fight for distribution opportunities. So we're doing that. We're aware that, you know, I mean, Netflix already takes documentaries. Um, the documentary on Nigeria uh, uh, is on Netflix. There is a doc, it was done by, um, by local producers here. Uh, the documentary by, by Beverly Naya Skin uh, is also on Netflix. So we do know that they are not averse to it. Um, so we will engage with the aggregators. We will continue to, uh, beg and, and, and plead and hopefully expand, you know, uh, uh, the opportunities that they give uh, to documentaries as well. But there are many platforms across the world that are offering spaces for documentary. So if you just Google, you will find that none of these platforms hand out um, invitations. You have a film put a distribution pitch together, go and research, find them, contact, write emails. These are things that I think we all have to learn as filmmakers, that the whole idea of, oh, our country doesn't have, our country doesn't have, our country doesn't have, it's the same everywhere. You listen to Egyptian filmmakers, they say, oh, our country doesn't have, our country doesn't have this, or has not done this, or has not done that. But the truth of it is, within that setup, you will find filmmakers who are diligent in research, who are putting paperwork together, who are you know, reaching out 
to commissioning editors, reaching out to platforms, reaching out to broadcast organizations, you're not going to get a yes from everybody. But out of every 10, no, if you get a yes, you're moving forward. But you can also create your own distribution. We are now in an age where you can actually set up a website for your film and you can set up a payment um, gate for that, for that film on your own platform and you can create advertising and promotion for it anywhere you wish. So really the idea that um, I don't want to do something because I don't know where the distribution will be, um, perhaps is not as, 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 uh, as true as, as maybe we make it. There's a lot of local, um, um, how shall I say, uh, small space uh, um, platforms as, as well in the US. Uh, there are platforms distributing African documentaries in states like South Carolina, in places like, um, uh, uh, what's this place now? Around Atlanta, there are, there are platforms that are just for blacks. And a lot of them will take films from Nigeria, will take documentaries about the African experience. Um, there's a lot of platforms as well that are in French that you know will ask you to subtitle or change or translate. And that might be a little more money than you need to spend, but some of them will also do them uh, for you. So with a little bit of research, I think there are spaces that are not that difficult to find, to try. Not every film um, will qualify to go in in a in a in a in a, in a big cinema. Um, some you may have to sell to a broadcaster. So really, it just it just it just really depends. Um, but abroad, there are distribution agents. Filmmakers are not their own distribution agents because it's a totally different market, a totally different set network. Um, and, 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 and connections. Uh, so one of the things we still have that's very difficult for filmmakers yeah, is that you have to be your own manager, your own promoter, your own um, distribution agent, unfortunately. Um, but again, you know, I look forward to the next five, 10 years. Hopefully um, there would emerge also entrepreneurs in different aspects of filmmaking who will take over those sorts of opportunities uh, away from the creatives. Okay, thank you very much. Friend. Well, our time is just about up. Uh, well, if you look in the chat box, uh, annually has dropped there an address for the uh, platform for documentary films, those who are interested in that question. But we'll just take one, Femi, just two words, please, just to respond to Ulusoji's question uh, as a way of rounding up. He says, what relationship do you see with the performing arts, live theater, and film in impacting storytelling? I think that's at the core of what we've been talking about. If you just say two quick words to that before. I didn't get the question right. Please repeat the it question. Says, what relationship do you see between the performing arts, that's live theater, and film in impacting storytelling? Well, there are two kingdoms who share citizens. <laughs> uh, I feel like the experience is two different things. The experience of the theater is immediate, is now. Um, you cannot, you get immediate feedback from an audience. Uh, no two performances are the same. Uh, the chances of error by an actor is, is zero. The rehearsal is more intense. They just so much. But it's far away. We sit there, they're far away. And, and we don't get a chance to actually um, explore that story beyond the wide shot that we see of the stage, which is why cinema is different. Cinema tells the story through the camera. And we have the benefit of the big close up and the fact that a director shapes our experience of the story by determining where the, the close up is and where is the cutaway. Um, so he decides what part of the story we, we consume. That's the difference. And I think there are two different experiences. They're not one and the same. You can't take a play written for, for stage and try to shoot it the way it is. You have to create a screenplay for it. But the audiences are entitled to these two experiences. 
My feeling is we must go away from trying to make the theater experience elitist. That's the real problem today, is that our audiences, theater in Nigeria was very, was popular art. It started with the masquerades in the, in the center of the, of the village. The performance arts are not just acting. It's also the dance, drama. It's also the drums. It's also, you know, there's just so much. And it started from the grassroots. In moving it, um, in not empowering that movement, that grassroots, because the Ogun days and, and all the early theater people were grassroots. They are traveling theaters. Now we've got theaters at Muson Center and all of that. And um, the cost of going to theater is so high, it's not affordable. We have to get to a place where we have to revive theater because it's what's nearest to storytelling about our culture and our history and our, and our tribes. And the things that we are missing about our origins tend to be embedded in the stories of our theater. And I think it's important that we figure out a way to re-empower popular theater, grassroots theater, and to ensure that you know, both the elite theaters and the grassroots theaters operate and are funded and are encouraged and are empowered um, because they're very great ways to empower people, our people with their history and, 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 and so many other things. Film is a totally wonderful, different thing. And um, it takes a very talented, very, very talented actor to be able to make the switch between the two. Because, you know, not every actor can take the scrutiny of the camera. Um, and not every actor has the range and the projection that you need um, for theater. So I don't think there's, a, I, don't, I don't ever want us to mix them up. They have to be separately empowered. Um, because they deliver very different experiences. Thank you so very much. Unfortunately, our time is up. We truly enjoyed this now to tackle, but please don't worry, we'll start uh, making the time out to be with us. I hope you have enjoyed this as much as I have. And thank you, Femi. You'll need to drink a lot of water after this to save your throat after all the talking. <laughs> but thanks a lot. We've truly enjoyed this. I, I, hope, I hope we can we can do this again. It's been very informative, very educative. So once again, please thank you all, everyone, for being here. And we will respond to your questions, the ones that we have not been able to take in this hour and a half. Thank you all so much and do enjoy your day. Once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.